Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to paint a jar or a, a pitcher of sunflowers, and we're gonna paint it in kind of a loose fashion, which I think will be a lot of fun. I'm working on some very inexpensive watercolor paper. This is the Strathmore Wind Power watercolor paper, and the nice thing about this is that it's recycled. You get 15 sheets instead of 12 in a pad, and it's very affordable. Most of your craft stores will have it. If not, you can easily find it on Amazon or any of your favorite online art supply stores. This paper has more sizing in it than your typical Strathmore watercolor paper and it has a beautiful um, texture that almost looks like a handmade paper which I think is really pretty and if you want that kind of um, very artistic uh, high-end look without spending the money it's a great way to go about it. Um, you'll want a couple round brushes and also something to sketch with and you can use a regular pencil or you could use watercolor pencils if you don't want to uh, have your lines showing. I will draw a little bit darker than you're going to want to on your paper just so that you can see what we're uh, doing. We're going to start off by making a rectangle for the pitcher, and because you're not seeing the whole pitcher, you can just make a rectangle. Now keep in mind this is going to be kind of like on the bottom uh, quarter to third of your page for this portion here. Then it's going to taper up a little bit on the sides. I am not going to be really fussy with my sketch, but I'll give you a tip. If you are sketching and you think it looks a little bit um, lopsided or awkward, flip it around upside down and look at it that way. Now if you need more help in step-by-step -step drawing instruction or loose flower watercolor instruction, I do have classes on both of those and I will link them up below in the video description. Now I'm just going to put part of a handle here because that's all we can see from our reference photo which I will also link up and that's all there is to that. Now like I mentioned before, look at it upside down and you'll be able to see if you have anything off. I, like I mentioned, I'm working with a soft pencil and my lines are darker than you want to have yours. And I recommend only erasing the lines that you absolutely know are wrong or that you don't need. Don't fuss too much with the eraser. You don't want to damage your paper. And then to remove the crumbs, I just like to take a, just a large brush and dust them away. Now for the flowers, we're simply going to sketch on some circles where we want them to be. We've got a nice big one in the front here. Very, very light circles though, okay. And this will kind of help you balance everything out and make sure that you have enough and it's not overcrowding. Don't start drawing petals on. When you start drawing petals, you get really fussy. And uh, if you need to make a change, like, oh, I have too many flowers, or this isn't going to work, I'm going off the page and I don't like it, or I wish I had two over here instead of one big one, I'd rather have two small ones. That's why we just do circles or ovals, just get the basic shape in there right off the bat, because you don't want to spend a bunch of time sketching something and then realize that you need to erase it, okay? So that's why we do that. And we'll be doing a lot of the drawing with actually just our paintbrush, so... Uh, so there's no need to get too detailed here. Now this is going to comprise the whole flower, so inside of the big circles I'm just going to put a smaller circle or oval just to indicate where my flowers are going to go. But I'm really not going to put much detail other than that because we're going to do that work with our paintbrush. Round paintbrushes are very easy to make petals with, so we're going to let that do the work. And when you're doing a loose style like this, you really don't want to get too fussy with a bunch of um, with a bunch of extraneous lines. Now we're going to take a look at the watercolors that we're going to use. You can use whatever brand you want. You just want to make sure you have a nice variety that will give you all the colors that you're trying to achieve. So uh, what I have, and I'm just going to swatch them out with you. I have got a nice kind of um, like a quinacridone magenta kind of color, so we've got a cool red, so whatever cool red you like the best. Then we've got a raw sienna or yellow ochre, depending on which color you have and you like the best. Okay, it's kind of an earthy yellow. Then we're going to get like a bright yellow, like a new gamboge, a bright warm yellow, new gamboge, Indian yellow, cad yellow deep, one of those colors. Now I will tell you cadmium yellow is a little more opaque, so you might want just something that's a little, little more transparent because your opaque colors will tend to go muddy on you. Now this is a cinnabar green, but you can also use sap green, very similar. I've got an ultramarine blue, and I chose ultramarine blue because I know it'll make some lovely violets with my magenta there, but also it granulates, so it will give us a beautiful texture on our paper. 
And then last but not least, we have either Burnt Umber or Burnt Sienna. You can look at your um, your collection of paints and see what you want to use there. Now we can make all the colors that we're going to need from those colors. And if you need to test them, then test them over here on this strip and we'll do our painting over here. So one thing I like to do is I like to kind of loosen up right off the bat and get some water on my paper. I've got two water jars here. One is for cleaning my brush, this bigger one, and the smaller one is for getting fresh water when, I'm, when I want to um, do some washes. So I'm gonna take this nice big juicy brush and I am going to just simply wet a few areas. I'm gonna wet the area of the pitcher under the flowers just a little bit, not everything, just a little bit. I'm also going to wet the shadow area, so I'm just gonna bring that color right off the pitcher, get that shadow in there. I'm also going to um, give this a little bit of like, a, kind of like a table line here, and just wet a little bit. Try to carry it across here. And then I'm gonna splash on some water. And I know by doing techniques like this, it's gonna help me get a really nice fresh look. Now I know I'm gonna have a lot of yellow in here, so I am gonna to wanna to have some colors that's gonna make that yellow pop. So the opposite of yellow is purple. So I'm gonna mix myself up some purple by taking some ultramarine blue. Now I'm working with a really uh, wet brush, so um, I'm getting a lot of water into my mix. So if you're having issues with that, go with a stiffer brush. This is a... Um, Faux Squirrel, it's a Princeton Neptune. There's so many wonderful alternatives to animal fur brushes. I am actually gonna go with a slightly stiffer one here. I'm getting too much water in my mix. Oh, that's pretty. Okay, and what I'm going to do is go back to that really juicy brush and I'm gonna add some of that to the top of my paper. Now I find that if my paper is wet, I get some really beautiful texture of, um, of the paper. And the reason I just kind of splashed on some water before is so that I can get some unusual effects happening. Now another thing I like to do is take a spray bottle and just kind of tip my paper and spray down, like spray under where I've added some color and kind of force it to drip. Now you'll want to have a rag handy so you can blot off any that are any um, paint that's going into the flower blooms. But for the most part, you just want to kind of let it do its thing. I'm also going to get some shadow color going. And I am going to, I'll mix it up with my less juicy brush. I am going to use ultramarine blue and either my Burnt Umber or Burnt Sienna, whichever one you are using today. That's gonna to make us a nice neutral granulating gray, which will look really pretty on this paper. And I am gonna put this on my pitcher here under the flowers. And the paint's only gonna flow where we have water on the paper. So this is where we get those kind of fun, kind of happy accidents. We'll see like color start to float around. I'm gonna pull some there into that shadow that we wet earlier. Now sometimes I like to let my paint mix on the paper so I could go in and I could just grab some of the blue on its own and drip that in and let it kind of mix and mingle around. I really just like, I love the way this, this paper looks and it's so inexpensive, uh, but I just think it's got such a pretty quality to it that I kind of like to do these loose techniques on it because I just think it's so pretty. A little bit of this blue on its own. Now, you probably want to just kind of be aware of any areas you might want to leave white for like highlights and try not to um, try not to paint on them. If you want to soften an edge, that's really easy. Just take a clean brush, you blot it so you can take out the extra water, and then you just go along an edge. And then you can just kind of fade it out. 
because you want that bit of contrast between your soft and your hard edges. I'm going to go back to this bigger, juicier brush. This is like a number 16, I think, a number 16 round. And I am going to just kind of spread a little of this paint a little bit. Just to give it an all over feeling. Now, another color I want to get going into the mix here is this yellow ochre. And you can use that to warm up some areas here. A lot of times if I'm painting in a loose style like this, I like to let the paint mix on the paper because it'll just give me a fresher look. You don't want mud. That's, that's one thing you want to avoid when you're watercoloring. So you want to let your paint kind of, uh, kind of do its thing and mix on the paper. Like if I mix that color with the yellow ochre before I put it down, I would just have this kind of mucky, muddy mess. But if I just kind of go in there and let them mix together on the paper, it's going to stay a lot more vibrant. And into any, if you want to have, um, I want to show you really what this, what's going on there. It's so pretty. You got this beautiful granulation there. Um, if you want to have some more textures in here, like you can see that kind of hard edge forming and this kind of ruffle forming, you can uh, spatter on your colors onto a drying wash and you'll end up with some really interesting texture if you like it. If you don't like it, then of course that's how you avoid getting that texture. You don't spatter or go back into a wet wash. So, um, kind of learning about the different qualities will help you be able to either keep it more controlled if you want to or keep it looser if that's what you want to do. Now the next thing I want to do is go in and do some of the centers of these flowers and this is so fun because this is where you can get your really dark uh, darks and you can get those really strong shadows and uh, get your values kind of placed and what you want to do is just make sure you're using a brush that does not hold too much water because you're going to be mixing some darks. So um, one of my favorite dark mixes, obviously, is the ultramarine blue and the burnt umber or burnt sienna. If you don't have ultramarine blue, if you have cobalt blue deep, that will work really well. Or cobalt blue hue will work because that's probably the ultramarine blue pigment. And you know, if you don't have any of these colors that I'm mentioning, just look at your watercolor set and eyeball it and pick whatever's closest. Because sometimes you'll get paint that just doesn't disclose what's what the colors are, or they'll have very strange names because maybe they were um, made in another country, or they were made more for a calligraphy market or a craft market, and it'll just be a little bit different. The names will be a little different. Okay, and the other reason you want to use kind of like a, a stiffer brush like this is because when you're working in these little pans, if that's what you have a small pan of color, um, it can be damaging to a softer brush. So, you know, not only will you get brighter color, but you'll be able to save your brush a little bit more. And we also want to get some sap green or cinnabar green, whatever you're using. Uh, the Renaissance colors that I'm using, they call it cinnabar green. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to use those today. Working upstairs in my heated office. Wicked fancy. Fancy new camera. Heat my office. Oh my gosh. I'm living the high life. What can I say? Okay. Those of you that have followed me for a while know that I usually <laughs> work in a cold, unheated basement. Um, all right. So I'm just going to start in. I think I'll start in with the burnt sienna, actually. And I'm going to start in with this uh, this flower in the front. Now notice, when, I, when I'm putting in color, I am not keeping a smooth edge because when you have a bunch of petals growing out they're going to give you you're going to have these like uneven kind of bits of texture points of of color where the petals are coming around so i want to make sure that i kind of leave that organic edge like that so this is kind of like a negative painting technique so i'm painting around where the um where the petals are going to be i'm going to grab some of that mix with the ultramarine in there to give it a nice dark I am going to just rinse my brush off and grab some of the sap green as well. Now the one thing you're going to notice, if you're used to using cotton paper and you grab a, a pad of this for fun, for practice and whatnot, you're going to notice that you're not going to have as smooth of a, um, of a wash. It's going to want to bloom and the reason for that is because the this is a wood pulp paper and so it's not going to dry as evenly and it's not going to be quite as absorbent. So um, so you may struggle with this if you're used to cotton paper, uh, the, the uneven drying, drying time. So you can kind of um, 
uh, meld them together a little bit, kind of nudge them into submission um, and put them where you want, put the colors where you want, but try not to overdo it because this is where you're going to have some really interesting fun things happening. Grab a little bit of both of those yellows and just kind of put a little bit of a highlight in here. All right, so and then you want to leave it. If you do need a little bit extra shadow, you can, um, like I would probably just go into the ultramarine blue, maybe pick up a little bit of that purple mix and just dab it in there and leave it alone. If you want a brighter highlight, if you feel like you went a little too far, uh, dry your brush off, clean, dry your brush off as much as you can, and you can go in and you can lift some out. Just you're drinking up that, uh, that pigment, that water with your brush and putting like a little half circle in there kind of shows you like a little bit of the raised, uh, the raised seeds there that would catch the highlight. But try not to overdo this. Try to let it kind of do its thing. And look how pretty just the paint. Even if you had like no plan and you were just slapping paint down, it's going to be pretty because it's a good quality paint on a good quality paper. So, um, I mean, it's an inexpensive paper, but it's certainly got a lot of the interesting qualities that a, um, that a more high-end paper would have. So we're gonna keep doing that for all of the centers here in this picture. Um, just vary it a little bit each time. And if you happen to hit one of those splashes that we put down originally, then, then you're gonna get some fun effects. Don't freak out, That's we put those splashes down there so that we would get some of those effects. And um, this being a heavily sized paper means that instead of absorbing into the paper, like say a cotton paper typically would want to just without doing anything, um, the paint is going to stay on the top and it's just going to stay wet there, kind of like you just dropped a, you know, a drop of water on a glass plate or something. And it just, I think, gives you a really fun effect. And you might not put green in one, you might put not put blue in one, you know, just kind of vary them all. Um, now just kind of really trust your sketch that you put on there. If you only have a tiny little spot, like here, like this one right here, we just see a little smidgen of that center. You can just put one or two colors and call it good. The areas where you have the larger parts showing, that's when you really want to be, um, you know, have fun with those colors and, you know, make the most of it. Uh, I find it's uh, kind of nice to start with the burnt sienna or the burnt umber. Now, um, the reason I like to use a pre-made or a, a burnt umber, burnt sienna from the tube, a brown from the tube is because, and you may think, why don't you just mix it, Lindsay? You can mix those, your primaries together and get brown. Well, the reason why um, I like to use the brown from the tube or from the pan, just a, a brown paint, is because I can get a single pigment brown paint. So this is PBR7, it's made with one pigment. So that's gonna be more vibrant than me mixing a brown. It's gonna have a lot more luminosity because it's just made with one pigment. As you start mixing colors, which you should definitely learn how to mix colors, um, but once you start getting you know, three or four pigments in a color, it cuts down on the saturation of that color and the color becomes duller. So this is gonna be a more vibrant brown because it's made with one pigment. It's, a, it's much more pure, and then if I mix this brown with other colors, they're also going to be more vibrant than if I mixed, you know, three or four colors to get a brown, and then mix that on top. So, and, and it's very convenient, because if you have to mix brown every time, you're going to be, you know, you probably make, you know, bathtubs full of mud before you get exactly the color you want, and that takes a lot of time, and then re reproducing the exact same color can be kind of uh, daunting. Not that you shouldn't, but, you know, if I'm at home and, I'm, and I have the room to have, you know, the colors that I want, then I definitely will use a, a pre-made brown. Now, I, I have people ask me sometimes what they should do for a palette. Should they get a palette with, with half pans? Should they get full pans? Should they buy it from tubes? Um, Quality-wise, as long as you're getting a decent paint, it really doesn't matter. Um, if you like to paint smaller and you use round brushes or smaller brushes, your half pans will be just fine. If you like to use flat brushes or like larger round brushes, like big round brushes like this, you're going to run the risk of damaging them with small half pans. So you're better off to get either a palette that you can squirt your paint into or uh, get full pans. So, you know, and if you get paint in the tubes and you have a little more custom customizability as to what you end up with for a palette, because you can buy empty half pans or full pans, or you can buy a palette where you can have big wells to squirt your color into, or you can just use a, a plate and just squirt it out as you need it. And um, none is right or wrong. It just depends on what you like to do. 
I like to let my paint dry in a palette or let it dry in half pans because I just get a little bit, I feel like I don't waste as much and I'm just used to going from dry pans and that's how I prefer to work. But there's nothing, you know, right or wrong about it. It's just my preference. So kind of keep that in mind when you are deciding what you want to do. And you might change your mind. There's nothing wrong with that either. You know, you might start off with a studio palette and love that and then realize you want to go travel with your paints. And so you buy a little tiny palette to, to take with you on the go. And, uh, and that's fine too. Or you might find that just a small palette suits your needs for how you like to paint at home or away. Um, and everybody is different. That's why there's a bajillion different types of pal palettes you can get. So here I put the brown in and then I just dripped in the blue rather than using any of the mixed colors because I figured that would give me a really nice, uh, really nice color there. A little yellow ochre. And notice my water buckets here. The clean one is still clean, the dirty one just keeps getting dirtier. So by going with two buckets of water when you create, you don't need to change your water so frequently. You might be able to even get a day or two before you have to go and change your water, but definitely a painting or two, even when you're doing really bright colors like this. We got two more centers to do. This time I think I'll actually start with maybe the purple and then start adding colors into that and see how that looks. That purple is going to really go a long way to make our yellows look really nice and really vibrant. Uh, let's do some brown into that and some blue. And if your paint's dry, you probably notice that I don't always rinse my brush in between. Um, if your paint is dry on your palette, oftentimes you can just go in there and even if you do contaminate it a little bit, you leave some behind, you can just pick it up and wipe it right off. So, you know, so sometimes, especially if I'm going to keep re-dipping in the same colors, I'll just wipe it off at the end if there's any residual color left. And then if you have color on your brush from like maybe wiping it out of another another area, you can go in and add it to the next area. And this one we just have a little bit showing, so I just want to get that in there. Maybe a little bit of green. I love working on a glass palette or a ceramic mixing palette just because your colors will not beat up and they lay out nice and flat. I apologize for any glare that you might be getting. I'm still getting used to my new camera and light mounts up in my office, so uh, it might be a little, little strange there. Um, so at this point, I think what I'm going to do is let this dry and then we'll come back and we will put some petals in and maybe do a little design on the jar. I'm not exactly sure if I want to put anything on the picture yet, but it will definitely need at least some shadows on there to um, help uh, break it away from the tabletop. So let it dry, go grab a cup of tea or something, and then I'll see you back here in a minute. Okay, I've let this dry and I want you to look at the beautiful granulation that has happened here in the centers of the flowers, in the shadows, in the background. Um, a lot of that granulation can be attributed to using ultramarine blue because it has such a granular effect and also the burnt sienna. Um, it's just really pretty on this paper. I think it's uh, it just it's just another layer of the beauty of watercolors. So what you want to do now is get a round brush. Uh, I'm going to use a number... Um, probably around an 8 to a 10. This actually says it's a number 6, but um, I think it's because it's a foreign company. It has a different kind of a, a scale. And I'm going to start off just with yellow. And I might need to switch to a softer brush because this is pretty, pretty springy. Um, I am going to start making some petals. So the key, I think, to doing really nice um, florals is to vary your colors. So, and also um, make sure you're balancing them. So I think of this as like points of a compass. So all of my petals are going to radiate from the center. So I'm always kind of changing the direction that I am pulling it. I'm pulling it out from the center to the outside, like spokes on a tire or spokes on a bicycle rather. Now, if it's easier, for you to start on the outside and work in, you could do that too, and you could even alternate it a little bit and uh, do some some way and some the other. Uh, now the next thing I'm gonna do is grab a little bit of another color. Um, I think I will grab some of the raw sienna or yellow ochre. And you could do a few like that. If you just kind of put the tip of the brush down, press and lift, you will get a very nice petal shape. And now for a little bit of um, 
kind of more distinct difference. I'm going to grab a little burnt sienna. And I might do just kind of like cut in little, uh, little shapes like that. Those are really good, especially if you've got a little bit of an overlapping from something else that you didn't really plan for. And I also want to make a little bit of an orange, and I'm going to take the yellow, our nice warm yellow, and add a little bit of the magenta color. We can add some of that in as well, and that just gives you a nice bright color, a nice clean, fresh, vivid warm. And if you know you have some shadow area, what you can do is pick up some of your uh, purple, because that's the opposite of the yellow, and you can desaturate colors with that. So you just kind of go in anywhere you think you'd have some of the petals getting shadowed. Just don't overdo it because it can get real muddy. This is also really good over the, um, if you're overlapping the, the can a little bit or some other uh, element where the yellow just is too transparent. That will work really well. I also want to get some of the sap green going. Because you'll be able to see little bits of the uh, both leaves and you will see like um, kind of that little, uh, those little short spiky um, bits of foliage behind. Some of these, like right at the where the, the petals come to the stalk, there's like these spiky green uh, green areas. I want to go ahead and put some of those in at the base of some of these other flowers, especially ones that are turned away from us so we see the side. That's generally where you'll see those a lot. So I'm adding those in around like this one that's going from the side. And I'm just using the sap green on its own because I realize it's probably going to get mixed in with some other stuff as we go. So I want to kind of keep it fresh. And plus your sap green, your cinnabar green, those are all going to be mixes. Um, so they've already been mixed once. So you've already at least got two colors in there, two pigments. So you just want to minimize uh, the chance of getting mud. And then if you want any, um, if you want any like bigger leaves, you can throw those in as well. Just um, I would try to get them somewhere you have a little bit of room to to kind of sneak them in there. I uh, will. I'll just. I think I'm just going to put one right in here and just kind of negatively paint around that flower. And I think there'll be enough um, enough overlap on the jar where there's that blue to give it a nice natural shadow. Um, Maybe I'll just put like a little bit of one up here. Just keeping in mind that I am kind of painting around some flowers there and I want to make sure that I don't lose um, too much. And I can put another one over here after I get those petals in and I decide exactly how I want everything to lay out. So another thing you want to keep in mind when you're doing this is that if you go in with a flower petal next to something that's wet, your colors will will bleed together. That might be really pretty or it might be a disaster. So just kind of keep that in mind that if you're going to throw in some, some petals that you know if it's going to bleed into what's next door or not. And really that, that one on the front is where you're going to want to pay the most attention to what colors you use. As you're getting away from that one and it's less of a focal point, you don't have to worry about it so much. And you can leave some white bits here and there poking through because um, that will give you kind of like a highlight. If you want to um, lighten anything, just kind of clean your brush off and you can go in with that damp brush and kind of spread colors around where you want it lighter or even lift off like we did um, in the center a little bit there when it was really dark. So, um, you know, just... You can just kind of gently work an area and then lift off that paint if you want to. You can blot it with a paper towel. Sometimes it ends up with you taking too much away, so just kind of keep that in mind. And I wouldn't go lifting in the center of any of these. If you decide you want to lighten them up after you've gotten all of your other colors in and your values in, that would be a better time uh, to lift. Those are all sedimentary colors for the most part, so they will come up really easily. And I'm really just kind of having fun here. I'm not 
fussing too much. I know this these petals right here behind this flower will tend to be a little bit darker. And I think I'm going to end up putting a little more green in there, but I want to get the yellow petals in first. Now, if you want to tone down the brightness of this yellow, you can grab a little smidgen of the ultramarine blue. Because ultramarine blue has more of red undertones, it shouldn't um, make your your yellow get greeny. It should just kind of desaturate it a little bit and, and cool it down. So you'll have almost like a little bit of a, a dirty lemon kind of color. So that's an option if you want to just kind of cool down the temperature of some of those petals, and desaturate them a little bit. I'm just having fun with this. This is so much fun to paint. Sometimes I'll just kind of go in with a um, kind of a muddier color to put some shadows in and then go and get some nice fresh, um, fresh paint and then put some brighter petals in. And any of these colors really are fair game because when you look at a bouquet of sunflowers, you're going to have, I'm here wiping out some of that green from the leaves so it looks like the petals are kind of overlapping. When you look at a bouquet of sunflowers, you're going to see greens and browns and reds and oranges and all these different colors. So you might as well represent that with your watercolor palette because you have all those colors. I love the lifting technique especially on this paper because it lifts really easily. So that's another reason I recommend this uh, for beginners just because you've always got a little bit of an undo button. I mean, it's not perfect. You obviously want to try to get your colors in there right off the bat um, correctly, correctly, but if you don't, it's really easy to fix it. You can also scrape in with the back of a, a, um, a paintbrush or a credit card or something if you want to, if you feel like you've just got a blob and you don't have any... Um, definition. If you do it to one flower though, do it a couple other places so it doesn't stick out. And let's go up to this one there. Some nice bright yellow up here. And I think this one I might pull the the petals down in so that I end up with a nice defined sharp one at the top. If you get those values in there right, like we did with our with our centers, it makes everything um, really interesting and lively and not dull and um, and flat. So it doesn't have to be realistic. You just want to get those values right so you have some of that interest in your in your painting. Put a few of the darker petals over here first since I have that on my brush, and then I'll go in with my brighter yellow. Now, I also get um, some comments where people are like, oh, I love that painting until you do the spatter. Or, Why does everybody spatter their paintings now? I don't like that. Well, with your painting, you can do whatever you want. I want you to always keep that in mind. You don't have to follow other people's instructions to a T. Uh, they're guideposts. They are there to help you decide what you want to do. And then when it's your turn, when you're doing your painting, you paint it however you like. So... Um, Keep that in mind. Anytime you see any sort of tutorial online, you don't have to like how they do every bit. It's like if you watched a home decorating tutorial and you didn't like, um, you know, one type of product that they're using, you don't have, you wouldn't go out and use it just because you know the person on TV said you should, right? You would, you would do your own thing. And same thing with art. You just gotta kind of pick and choose what's gonna, what's gonna be best for your style. I like spattering, so I spatter from time to time. But I can understand if you don't. I think it's really important to know why, if you like something, why you like it, and if you don't like it, know why you don't like it, because it could just be you've never used it at an appropriate time, and maybe you've tried the spattering technique, but when you used it, it was not on a painting that really would have been would have been uh, helped by the spattering, so I think that happens too sometimes. I'm going to get a little leaf there. I feel like maybe a couple more. I like I like the look of the leaves. And you can also add a little ultramarine blue if you want to darken them a little bit. Let's put one over here. This is just the cinnabar green on its own. I have a little bit too much moisture on my brush, so I blotted it. And I'm just going to paint around those petals. 
if they bleed, I'm not going to worry about it. And now I am going to grab some ultramarine blue because for a couple of reasons. One, I think it will look nice with a little shadow. And also, there's so much orange in that flower that the blue will be its opposite and make the orange pop more. So I'm taking the ultramarine blue. Actually, the more I look at this, I think it's a cobalt blue deep. <laughs> but it's all right because it works. Ultramarine's a little bit stronger. Um, I'm just going to add that in and let it mix on the paper. And I just kind of carried that shape out a little bit because I noticed my thing was starting to dry and I didn't want to have uh, ruffly edges within the leaf. So that's why I did that. If you want it lighter, you want to highlight, you can go in with some yellow and kind of just add a little bit of that on there and let it, let it mix on the paper. And you can also lift out a highlight with a damp brush. So, like, you know, do whatever you think your painting needs. Now, looking at this, I feel like I need a little bit more green in there. And maybe I'll stick a little leaf right there. And, of course, it's completely up to you how much you want to add. All right, and if you want a little blue in there, go for it. If you don't think it needs it, then, then leave it be. All right, so I'm going to mix up a little shadow color. I'm going to do the, the uh, blue and the brown again. And that will just give me a nice gray. It's the same colors we had used already, so we know it's going to match. And what I'm going to do here is I feel like I need to do something to kind of break this away from the bottom. Oh, I realized I just forgot a flower. We're going to put that extra flower in there in a minute. Um, but first, I just want to kind of get a little bit of just a little line just to kind of break that away from the tabletop. And maybe even just bring it up on the side a little bit. And just feather it out a little bit because I don't want to ruin it. That's so pretty that I don't want to do anything that's going to um, mess with that. So I'm just take, going to take a damp brush. And just add that in there and try not to mess up that beautiful granulation that I have happening. I just kind of soft damp brush and lift up a little bit and then this one's even softer so I don't want to lift up anything underneath because it's so pretty oh and I am lifting a little bit so I have to be careful there oh shoot now see that's what I didn't want to happen I ended up lifting that out um so what a bummer okay so what I'm going to do actually now since I've done that is I'm just going to re-wet this entire area and re-add the color and hope that I can get it to um to behave like I want it to. Oh, that was a bummer. So that's that's that happens. That's how the cookie crumbled this time. But so if that happens to you, wet the area, spray on some water, and then um, I'm just gonna go ahead and mix up some more of that dark. I'm actually gonna mix it in a new spot in my palette because I think I'd gotten some other colors in there that I didn't really want. So again, the blue and some brown. And I'm just going to add it right up against that edge. And I'm just going to tip it to let it blend. And hopefully I'll get some of that magic back that I lost. And add some ultramarine on its own. Or whatever that blue is. Cobalt Deep or ultramarine, whatever it happens to be. I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that I can get that beautiful texture back. And that happens sometimes, and it's a bummer when it does, but teachable moment. I find that if I do need to let it go out further, I just use a little spray bottle, and that will just, it kind of prevents it from me lifting other places I don't want to, so. And then I'm going to let it drip down to the bottom. And I'm just going to guide it with that brush and just be able to pull off the extra water, I think. I'm going to wipe the tape and not my painting because I don't want to give myself blooms or lifts or anything where I don't want it there. I think I fixed it. It's not as pretty as it was originally, but I think it's going to be okay. So that happens sometimes and eh, what are you going to do, right? <laughs> okay, I forgot my little flower over there. So we're going to put that in. And I'm going to do it the same way I did before. I'm going to start off with my bright 
um, my bright yellow, I am going to start with the outside petals and just drag them in because I'll have a little bit more control that way. And I think I'll grab a little bit of that magenta. Oh, plus that magenta right next to that green just pops. It looks real pretty. And you can decide how much white you want to remain. I like the little sparkles of white myself, but that's completely up to you. Now we can look at the um, at the flowers. We know how easy this is to lift because we've just done some when we didn't want to do any. Uh, so if you want to lift any highlights, you can, and it's really um, it's really easy to do. You just kind of go in with a damp, clean brush, and just kind of. Uh, paint over the area that you want to lighten. Rinse and clean, blot it off so it's just a little bit damp and you can go in there and you can um, just kind of like erase it. Just don't get it too wet. If you get it too wet, you, chances are you're going to, um, you're just going to end up with a big blob and a cauliflower instead of a, a proper lift. Just in a couple of spaces. Just gives it a little bit of shape, which I think looks nice. And if you lift it out and you decide you want a little bit of another color in there, you can go ahead and, and drip in a little bit. Like I feel like this one might need a little bit of that sap green color in it. Just again, you want to watch how much water you have. You don't want to put a ton of water in there. Okay. Now I'm trying to, trying to decide whether I want to do any of the pattern on the, the jar or not. Um, and geez, I'm a little gun shy after <laughs> after my uh, my shadow there. I do think I want a little bit more shadow on the handle here. So I'm going to go in and put that in. That's a glaze. I'm just going over it with a transparent layer of color. Um, maybe just a little bit of a shadow like that. And, you know, I really don't think I want to put the pattern on that vase. I think I would like some spatters, though. Some, like, yellow spatters I think would look really good. Now, this is the point where you can say, I like it or I don't like it. I'm not going to do it. And that is completely fine, whatever you decide. If you want big spatters, go with a... Um, go with a bigger brush. It's going to give you bigger spatters. If you want really super tiny spatters, you want a smaller brush or you even want to, like, use a... Um, uh, use a toothbrush or something like that or a spattering tool because that will give you really tiny spatters. So that's completely up to you. I probably won't spatter red just because I don't want it to look, you know, bloody or anything. And if you get color where you don't want it, just go in with a, with a uh, damp brush and lift it out or a paper towel. I kind of liked a little bit of yellow there, so I just kind of spread it around a little bit. And if you get too many spatters, uh, and you don't like it, then you can um, blot it up before it dries. Now, if you spatter onto wet paint or wet paper, I think that looks really pretty because you get a, like a softer look. Oh, another thing I want to show you here is lifting because we've got highlights, kind of more highlights on the side. And you can lift out a, um, a highlight too. So lifting isn't, you know, you just need to learn how to control it and... Um, to get the effects that you want to get. But yeah, you can lift out your paint here and give it a little bit more roundness and highlight on this side. You'll get a much more, a much brighter lift if you go in with a paper towel and blot when you're done. So it just depends on how uh, how much you want to get back to the paper. Look at that, we're like down to the white of the paper practically. That's not possible with all papers, just to uh, just to let you know there. The thing you do need to be aware of is that um, it's really easy to get a hard edge here when you're lifting out. So just kind of keep that in mind. I'm going to soften my edge a little bit after I've got it lifted the way I want it. But look at that. We're like back to the white paper there. And I often find softening an edge like that is a little bit easier with a flat. And then just work it kind of back and forth on the edge. I don't want to get rid of all of it because it's so pretty. Just 
just want to get that highlight kind of um, on this side and then, then across the edge like that. So um, I think that I'm going to dry this and remove the tape and see how it looks and see if I want to do anything else to it. And we'll see you back after that. Okay, let's remove the tape and see how this looks. Now, another um, benefit of heating your paper or drying it with a heat tool uh, before you remove your tape is that it actually makes the tape easier to remove. So if you forgot to stick the tape down to your, uh, your clothing to take some of the stickiness away, if it was a really sticky tape, it will help it. And also just try to remember to peel the tape kind of away from the painting instead of in towards it and that will reduce the chance of it ripping. I love seeing that uh, beautiful border after I take the tape off and I find that really can help me determine whether I need to adjust values or add anything else. So one thing I was looking at this realizing that it might be pretty, now I do have some nice granulation happening in the center there anyway, but I think just maybe dabbing in some really dark color and I would just mix together my darkest colors to get a nice dark shade. I would do my red, blue, and brown and just kind of dab in um, just a few dots of suggesting seeds just to, you know, give a little bit to some of these, um, these centers, not everywhere obviously, but just just a few dabs here and there for some texture. Um, I think I could do, go a little bit darker on the shadow on the side of this. I don't really want to mess with the table because I was able to get that granulation back, which I was really pleased with. Um, but I think I would like a little bit of a shadow on the edge. And I'm just going to go with the blue um, gray mixture, a little heavier on the blue, just so it's not muddy. And just kind of add that here on the edge. And you do have to be careful with this paper because it does want to lift really easily. But it's so pretty. It's it just does such a lovely job granulating that it's kind of you know kind of a trade-off. And that just helps kind of break it apart again. I do kind of also feel like the table should be a little bit darker, but um, I don't know if I want to really mess with that because I have such a pretty granula granulation going right there. That might be one of those things that I think about and then, then return to later and decide. Um, well, we can probably do just a little bit, a little bit of shadow here. Uh, just going to be very, very delicate and actually I'm just kind of stippling it on meaning I'm tap tap tapping it on because I just want to not mess up that pretty granulation so I'm just tap 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 that's all I'm doing for my shadow here almost like the sun is coming through even though this is a shadow that would be from the um, from the jar I'm kind of diffusing it a little bit by just tapping and I think that's effective I just didn't want to mess up what was underneath. And there you have it. I think this turned out really well. It was a lot of fun to paint and I hope you give something like this a try. You don't feel like your paintings have to be perfect. You should really um, think about making them meaningful to you and having fun and learning. And the minute you feel like you're afraid to throw paint at that paper, that's when you need to throw paint at the paper because when you're afraid, that's when you grow in art. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you would like more in-depth, step-by-step watercolor flower instruction, check out my watercolor flower workshop or any one of my other workshops. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.